The following video is a recording of a lecture from Genes to Galaxies, the 35th Professor Harry Messel International Science School, presented to high achieving Year 11 and 12 students from across Australia and 10 other countries. Thank you. Um, is my microphone on and working? Everybody can hear me well? Great. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, this is my grand return from maternity leave where I've just had a baby six months ago and haven't done any astronomy. So um, I'm hoping that you will challenge me with interesting questions and get my brain working again. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is our own galaxy, the Milky Way, um, and try to give you a little bit of an idea about how the galaxy works and particularly focusing on the gas within the galaxy. So. Just to give you an outline of what I'll be talking about, um, I'll give you a little introduction to the Milky Way, taking measure of the galaxy, how we know about how big it is, what we think it looks like, why it's difficult to understand what the galaxy looks like. And then I'll move on to talking about how the galaxy works, um, focusing particularly on its interstellar gas and what that tells us about how the galaxy evolves and what's happening inside it. And then I'll try to finish up with a little bit about what's next, um, focusing on what telescopes are coming up in the future and what they'll tell us about our galaxy. Um, hopefully this follows reasonably closely to what's in the chapter that I wrote, so um, if you get bored or fall asleep, you can just read the chapter afterwards. Um, so I hope you're all familiar with the Milky Way, and if you're not, I give you strict instructions to get out of the city as soon as possible and look up into the sky. And if you are from the Northern Hemisphere, also, I really encourage you to look up to the sky because the Milky Way of the Southern Hemisphere is absolutely spectacular. So this is a picture of what the Milky Way looks like in optical. Um, I'm going to use the, I'm going to try to use the mouse as my pointer here. So if you can't see it, give a shout. So the Milky Way is this wonderful band of stars here, um, the Via Lactea, which is the sort of uh, the Latin name for it, which came out because it looks like a big, huge band of whiteness in the sky. And it's pockmarked by bits and pieces of dust. So these, you can see these sort of dark clouds here, and they block out the light of the stars behind them. Most of the stars uh, lie in a nice little thin disk, which is why you have this nice plane here. We have some nearby galaxies, which are these little things up here. These are our large and ma small Magellanic clouds. They're near to us, and I'll talk a little bit about them. Um, but, so this is the familiar view, uh, and I probably won't talk too much more about the familiar view, but I'll move into talking a bit more about the gas, which is something that we can't see with our own eyes. So the Milky Way is a real problem. Um, other types of astronomers who look at other galaxies, so galaxies are clusters of millions or billions of stars that are all held together by their own sort of gravitational force. Um, other astronomers who look at other galaxies, ones that are outside of our own, have a really nice job, I think, because they get to see a pretty picture of a galaxy and they look at it face on and they can see all the spiral arms and it's lovely. In the Milky Way, we're sitting right inside it and we're trying to figure out how big the forest is, how big the galaxy is. We can't move around, we can't fly above it, we can't do anything to get ourselves into a vantage point where we can actually see what the galaxy looks like. So we're stuck trying to figure out what it is just sitting here recording information about it. And that's not a very easy thing to do. So over the course of well, history, but really particularly over the past 50 years as we've been trying to understand um, what our galaxy looks like, the picture of it has changed enormously. And in particular, the um, spiral structure of our galaxy. So our galaxy is a spiral-type galaxy. Um, and it is in a, what's called the local group. So we are, there's two very big spiral-type galaxies that look like pinwheels, like the picture up there. They dominate all of the dynamics, the gravitational dynamics of our, our group of galaxies. And there's lots of little tiny galaxies that sort of float around. And we eat them up every now and then. And various things happen. Um, what the actual galaxy looks like is a difficult question. So here's some of the things we think we know. There's something like 200 to 400 billion stars in the galaxy. We can't count them. We can't walk around and just you know, count them all out. But that's sort of estimates based on what we can see around us and integrating around. We think 
that it's a barred type spiral, which means it has this long bar in the center, the straight bit, and then coming out from it are these spiral type arms. And these spiraling arms are made up of very massive stars, much more massive than the sun, um, or eight to 20 times the mass of the sun. They're very bright and they tend to be very blue. Uh, over the course of the past 50 years, we've gone from thinking that there were four spiral arms, five spiral arms, six spiral arms, two spiral arms, back around to four, and back down to two in the past uh, few years. So you could take your pick as to which one you think is the best model. Um, but this particular image that we have up here is an artist's impression of the best model that we have at present. So we've taken all the data that we have about the galaxy, put it together, and got something that looks vaguely like this, but it's an artist's impression. So it's, we can't make a picture like that of the Milky Way. Um, so some of the things that are difficult to understand in our galaxy, the most central one is to understand how far away is the center of the galaxy. So we sit out here in the sun, um, which is about out here. You can see that. Sort of out in the boring part of the galaxy, kind of not really much happening out here. And the center of the galaxy is in here, and there's probably a black hole there, a very massive black hole. Uh, but how far away is that? Is a big question. And everything about how big the galaxy is depends on knowing how far away the center of the galaxy is. It's sort of our reference point. So if we can measure how far away the center of the galaxy is, then we can start to figure out how far the rest of the edges are, uh, how fast it's moving. And there have been a lot, a lot of measurements of how far the galactic center is, and it varied, has varied over the past 30 years by um, as much as 25, 30%. Latest measurements are made by looking at the uh, stars that orbit the center, central black hole. The stars, there's a lot of stars that orbit very, very closely around the central black hole. And we look at those stars and we measure how far away they are, and that gives us an indication of this distance to the galactic center. And so that has given us our most recent and probably best measurements of 26,000 plus or minus 2,000 light years at the end of last year. And the usual ranges that we've been working with over the past, say, five years or so are anywhere between 24,700 to 27. 600 light years. Um, so that's the sort of range that we're working in. There's been some measurements even just published at the very beginning of this year, a completely independent method, which confirmed very well those measurements um, from Getz in 2008. So we're kind of narrowing in. I think you know, the error bars are getting reasonably small in the distance there. So the other things that have been come up in the past few years um, is that there are new features found in our galaxy all the time. So in 2005, it was decided that this bar actually was a, was a real thing here. And that was based on measurements of stars, red stars with a Spitzer Space Telescope. Um, and they saw that there were great big clumps in certain places that indicated that there's this bar at the center. It's not the sort of bar where you buy drinks, um, but the type of bar where you get uh, nice massive stars. Um, Another new feature to the model is out here, way, way far out in 2004, we found a new spiral arm. Um, and that's uh, a big extended gaseous bit of arm, which is marked out here on the map. And that bar plus the new spiral arm and various other information that's come out of the Spitzer telescope over the past three years ended up in a revised spiral model. Um, and this is that model there. So the revised spiral model has two very bright arms, this one here and this one here. Can everybody see that mouse moving around? Great, okay. Um, so these all have very obscure names, you'll notice. Uh, Scutum Centaurus, Norma, Perseus, outer arm. And you might think, you know, was there a person named Norma who found that arm and she got it called after her? Um, they actually come about because those arms, the brightest bits that we see in stars and in, in regions that form stars, lie in the constellations of those names. So the normal constellation has the brightest bit of that particular spiral arm. The Scutum Centaurus has its brightest bits in Scutum and in Centaurus. Um, so they got named after the constellations. But uh, we can always hope that we'll find another arm and get to call it after ourselves. That would be fun. In the egotistical way of science. Uh, so 
Then moving on, so the galactic center distance is really the, the big thing we need to know. We need to know how far the center of the galaxy is. That way we can then estimate how far, how big the galaxy is, and also things like how massive the galaxy is. So weighing the galaxy is also not a trivial thing. You don't just go out and put it on a scale. Um, it'd be a mighty big scale if you were trying to do that. So the way that we measure the galaxy's mass is to measure the distance and speed to mainly stars um, scattered throughout the galaxy. And then we use Kepler's third law, which hopefully some people have come across. This is what, how we determine the mass of planets. And it's based on looking at the period of the star, so how fast it's moving, or it's, it's how long it's going to take it to go around the galaxy, and its distance from the center of the galaxy. So the mass of the galaxy is here, the mass of the star is the next term there, and the mass of the star is basically negligible compared with the mass of the galaxy. So we just look at how far away a star is from the center of the galaxy, how fast it's moving, and that gives us an indication of what's called the rotation curve, and that's what we're measuring here. So let's say we've got a star where this red arrow is, uh, we've got a star with the blue, a star at the green, a star at the purple, and we measure their velocities, and we know their distances, and we put together a curve like this, so these measurements here. So that's just looking at the orbital speed versus the center from the galactic distance. Now, one of the funny things about the Milky Way, and you've probably all come across this with all uh, in popular literature, is that its speed keeps on going out. The gas is moving at a fairly flat speed all the way out, way past where the mass drops off. So the mass of the galaxy seems to drop off, or the visible mass seems to drop off somewhere around here. And if it were just a plain old Keplerian orbit, there was no more mass, then we would watch the orbital speed slowly decaying away. But it doesn't do that. And the reason for that is so-called dark matter. Um, so there's some something out there that's massive that seems to be sitting out holding the mass up so that the gas is, continues to rotate fast around the center of the galaxy, but we can't see it and we don't know what it is. And we see this in many, 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 many galaxies, um, and it's a wonderful field of research and also a great um, opportunity for science fiction writers to go nuts. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to talk really any more about dark matter, but just to point out that this is one of the ways that we see or that we know about its existence in the Milky Way. So typical measurements of all the stars that we have, sort of thousands of uh, stars, have come up with measurements of about 700 to 1,000 billion times the mass of the sun for the total mass of the galaxy. Um, most recently, in January 2009, you may have seen in the news, suddenly the, uh, the mass of the galaxy got heavier. Um, that was because they had new measurements of of star forming regions, of regions that are forming a lot of stars, which suggested that the galaxy is actually about 50% heavier than we thought in the past. Um, now, whether or not that, that'll hold up is part of the, well, part of what Harry said about always questioning science. There's no absolute truths, and as we question those answers, we'll come up with a, a better mass for the galaxy. Okay, um, so next, next thing about our galaxy, um, I guess I should have said straight away that. It has dimensions something like a compact disk. It's very, very thin where most of the stars are and circular. But it also has surrounding it a roughly spherical halo. And that's made up of sort of old stars that are floating around the galaxy in this nice, sort of smooth, spherical way. And this picture here is not of our own galaxy, but a galaxy that we think is somewhat Milky Way-like, the Sombrero Galaxy. And it's a beautiful image. Um, so this is the halo, all of this stuff, and you can see why it's called a halo. It's sort of a nice um, halo glowing around the disk of the galaxy there. So the Milky Way has stars in a very thin disk, about a thousand light years in thickness, and the gas in the galaxy sort of puffs up a bit thicker, um, up to about 12,000 light years. And that number was just recently revised by a researcher, a number of researchers here at Sydney Uni. Uh, who found that they, the, by looking at objects that are away from the gas, that it's actually a bit thicker than we thought in the past. So maybe 12,000 light years. OK. Um, so that's just the basics of how does the galaxy look like? What is it, how does it actually work is the next big question. And in this part, I'm going to focus really on how the galaxy works in terms of interstellar gas, because I think this is really the key to how galaxies work. So, Interstellar gas is all the stuff that's between the stars. So it's gas, it's dust, it's all the kind of 
bits and pieces of fluff that float around between the stars. And it's sort of like, oh, oh, the best way to think of it is sort of like the atmosphere for the galaxy. It conveys information about temperature, about pressure, from one part of the galaxy to another part in the form of sort of galactic weather systems. Um, so if you think about the Earth's atmosphere, it's a very nice analogy for the interstellar gas in the Milky Way. It's also the stuff from which stars form. So if there wasn't any interstellar gas, there wouldn't be any stars and what I wouldn't be seen here. Um, it's also the place where the stars go when they die. So sort of from dust to dust. Um, they form from the interstellar gas and they go back to it when they die. And you can see a lot when you're looking at uh, interstellar gas that you can't see when you just look at the stars. So the image that I've got on the right here is of three galaxies, a nice, this is not our own galaxy, but other galaxies, a nice spiral galaxy, a couple of little small ones. And you look at that in the stars and they look to be disconnected and sort of all floating, um, not near each other. But if you actually look at it in gas, you see that they're all connected up that the gas is being pulled off of one galaxy and moved to another one, um, that there's concentrations in places where you didn't see stars. So it tells you a lot more than just looking at the stars. So if you want to understand a galaxy, you need to look at both the stars and at the gas within the galaxy to try to get an idea of what it's actually doing there. Um, so the gas in the galaxy. Um, so I've been saying that there's gas and there's dust in galaxies. Dust is not like the stuff that I have floating around my house everywhere, um, but more like smoke particles, uh, very small conglomerations of molecules, which block out starlight from behind them. There's also in the interstellar medium just plain atomic gas, um, very basic gas, just atomic hydrogen, all the way up through complex molecules, um, alcohol, formaldehyde, whatever you want to find, you can find it. Uh, so the interstellar medium, all the stuff between the stars, is about 5% of the mass of the Milky Way. So it's not really hefty in terms of the, the dynamics of the galaxy, but as I said, it's, it's the atmosphere, the interesting bit. And it's separated into an assortment of phases, which are mostly in pressure equilibrium. So they, the density and the temperature, the pressure, the product of the density and the temperature of the gas is roughly constant as you move through the different types of phases. So we have atomic gas and we have ionized gas. Um, the, the types that we mainly see are cold and neutral gas. So that means it's, it's not ionized and it's quite cold. We see warm and neutral gas. We see hot and ionized, so it's lost its electrons and it's very hot. And then we see molecular clouds, which are where stars are formed. Um, and they're typically not in pressure equilibrium. Some of the views of what the interstellar medium looks like. Um, here up here, this is the image that we were showing, looking at before of the stars. And you can see the dust with these black spots bark, blocking out the gas, or blocking out the starlight, sorry. Below that, we see mainly dust, um, and this is traced in the infrared. So this is warm dust, and it's glowing in the infrared. Beneath that, um, we're looking at atomic hydrogen, so just neutral hydrogen gas, and that makes up most of the interstellar medium. And we see that at radio frequencies at 21 centimeters wavelength or 1,400 megahertz. And down below, looking at molecular gas, and that's typically observed in millimeter radio frequencies. So you can see that they all have a fairly similar kind of disk-like thin concentration um, as we move through. So every astronomer um, sits through a really boring interstellar medium class. And in that class, they memorize a set of numbers. Um, and I expect you all to have memorized them by the time I move away from this slide. And you can pass them back to other completely uninterested people who won't believe that these numbers are true. But anyway, we uh, memorize these numbers to be the, the densities and the temperatures for the interstellar medium in its different phases. And the reason I sort of mock them is because we, we can't directly measure them. And they're probably not just these pinpointed exact numbers, but the really wide range of densities and temperatures are actually represented. So what we see is we see molecular clouds with densities of something like 
um, 10 to the 2 to, to a million atoms per cubic centimeter, and they're very cold. They sit at about 10 degrees above absolute zero. And then moving up in temperature from there, we see cold and neutral gas, referred to as the CNM, and it has something like 10 to 100 atoms per cubic centimeter, temperatures of 50 Kelvin, and so on as we move up the, the range here. And if you multiply out the temperature and the density in all these cases, you'll see that they're roughly, roughly constant throughout the galaxy. Um, both the cold neutral medium and the warm neutral medium are traced by atomic hydrogen emission. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'm also going to talk about it because it's my own field of research, and that's what I'm most interested in. Um, so hydrogen atoms are really beautiful. Physicists can understand hydrogen atoms. We've got one electron. We've got one proton. That's not so hard. Um, these molecular things are difficult. We don't like that. We leave that for chemists. So we like just very, very simple hydrogen atoms. And they work in a really nice way. You either have, they're sort of like, um, you can think of it like a magnet. If you have, uh, they have poles, the electron and the proton have poles to them. They can either be aligned north and south or they can be anti-aligned. And there's a slightly different energy uh, if they're in one state, if they're aligned versus if they're anti-aligned. And every uh, 12 million years or so, it spontaneously flips from the higher energy state to the lower energy state. And when it does, it releases this little photon which goes zipping out through the universe, carrying a very puny amount of energy along with it. And if you're sitting at Parkes radio telescope, staring out there looking for this little photon to go cruising along, you will see it at 1420 megahertz. Um, and this is a beautiful, called spectral line, that emits at a very narrow frequency, and we see it beautifully with a radio telescope. Um, so the reason it's got a very, very, well, it's got a very puny amount of uh, energy, but the reason we can see it is because as you look through the galaxy, you generally see in any line of sight, any place you look, something like 10 to the 20 atoms per square centimeter on the, on the sky in the galaxy. So there's actually a lot of them. So even though this little flip happens only once every 12 million years, um, because there's so many atoms out there, we do see a significant number of them flipping and producing this beautiful little spectral line. And I'll show you some images that we can produce from that in just a few minutes. Um, so the really cool advantage about hydrogen, when you're actually looking at it, is because it's a spectral line, its frequency changes if it's moving with respect to us. So this is just the Doppler shift, it's, it's pitch. It's like if an ambulance goes past you and its pitch changes when it's coming towards you and going away from you. The same thing happens with what we see from the atomic hydrogen gas and we see its frequency change if it's moving with respect to us. Now this is really cool because it lets us tell not just what something looks like, but also how it's moving. And that gives us extra information to try to understand the galaxy. The other great thing about um, hydrogen is that it's a largely transparent wavelength. So it's a 21 centimeter wavelength. It's like, you know, that big. It goes through just about everything, you know, around trees, through bodies. Nothing blocks it out. So Unlike looking in optical light at our own galaxy where dust blocks out most of the stars and we only see the stars very nearby, 21 centimeter radiation just cruises all the way through the galaxy. And so we can see it over a very, very, very wide range of the galaxy. And in fact, out much further in the universe, but I'm not going to talk about that. And the other really great thing about looking at 21 centimeter radiation is that you get to play with really big toys. Um, so optical astronomers, you know, they get really excited if they've got an 8 meter or 10 meter telescope and we're like, Psh, forget that, 64 meter telescope, that's what I want. Um, if I could have a square kilometer, that would be even better. So we play with really fun, really big toys, like the Parkes telescope, the dish. Has everybody seen the dish, the movie The Dish? Good. Uh, if you haven't, go see it. Um, it's necessary, required reading. So the Parkes Telescope, which is where I just was um, until last night, actually. Uh, Green Bank Telescope is a 100-meter telescope that we use in West Virginia to study atomic hydrogen. It's also a beautiful telescope. Uh, Arecibo. Maybe you've seen this in a James Bond movie. Uh, 
There's something about radio telescopes and movies. So we must be on to something good. We've got Parks of the Dish, we've got Aaron Seabone, the James Bond movie. Um, we've got the VLA and Contact. Um, and we've got uh, the Australian Telescope Compact Array, which is waiting for its great feature length film. Um, so we have very fun toys to play with in, uh, in radio astronomy. OK, so um, moving on to talk about more in depth, moving away from just the canonical numbers, but the, what the interstellar medium tells us about how a galaxy works. And I'm going to go come back to this image a couple of times, so I'm going to try to sort of walk you through it in various different ways. Um, this is how we think the ecosystem of our galaxy evolves. So we have some diffuse gas sitting around the interstellar medium, just sort of blobbing around, not doing much of anything. It's kind of not too hot, not too cold, um, nothing terribly interesting happening to it. And coming in from intergalactic space, we have some gas adding to it, so it's sort of raining in. And somehow, this gas, which is just blobbing around, has got to cool down and condense into dense molecular clouds. And those are sort of examples of them here. And from those molecular clouds, stars can be formed. So you can't, you can't skip over this step. You don't go directly from diffuse blobby gas to stars. You've got to get into the molecular clouds. So we want to understand how this happens. And then these stars live their lives. And depending upon what kind of star they are, um, they may be very massive stars, in which case they blow themselves to smithereens at the end of their life. And they may send gas out into extragalactic space or through supernovae explosions or lock it up into to neutron, neutron stars, white dwarfs, and black holes. And so they die. They put their gas either away or back into the diffuse gas, and then it cycles back through this. So we have this little process that we go through. So what we're going to talk about here is we're going to talk a little bit about stellar winds and supernovae. We're going to talk a little bit about how gas cools and condenses a little bit about outflow to extragalactic space, and a little bit about infall to, from intergalactic space, and how we can look at all these different things in our galaxy and what they tell us about how the galaxy lives. So, um, first off, bubbles around massive stars. So massive stars are stars that are something like more than eight times the mass of the sun. And they have so-called stellar winds which move gas away from the star at velocities of up to 1,000 kilometers a second. So they're basically shedding gas constantly. Um, I can speak louder than that person, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, OK, so they're blowing gas out away from them at about 1,000 kilometers a second. So I think about 1,000 kilometers a second. That's not exactly a puny velocity. I mean, you know, your car drives at 100 kilometers an hour. We're talking 1,000 kilometers a second. This is moving very, very fast away. And over the course of a star's life, it expels something like 10 to the 38 megajoules of energy. Now, to give you some sort of comparison, because most people don't have really an intuitive idea of megajoules, um, the average Australian household uses 85 megajoules of energy in a year. Um, an atomic blast is something like 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 11 megajoules of energy comes out of an atomic blast. So there's a lot of energy coming out of these stars over the course of their lives, blowing out in these winds. Um, and when they die, they go boom, blow themselves louder than that probably, uh, to, to smithereens. And they force gas out at something like 10,000 kilometers a second. I got cut off a little bit by my figure here, sorry. Um, and it releases yet another 10 to the 38 megajoules. So what the effect that this has is it's something like a snow plow. It's cruising into the gas around it, all these stellar winds and supernovae, pushing everything that's in front of it away, and also heating up and ionizing things a bit. So this snow plow effect creates a nice little bubble of the gas around it. And this is what we're looking at here. This is an example of a, a relatively small bubble. It has a diameter of only 70 light years and was formed over probably about a million years. Um, so somewhere in here are very, very bright stars, very massive stars, and they've pushed the gas out into this nice little bubble here. And the galaxy is just absolutely riddled with these. They're everywhere. Um, and they're lovely to look at. So this particular one is, uh, is 
detected with the Spitzer Space Telescope, and the rim is made up of dust, which has been lit up by UV radiation from the stars inside it. Um, so that's a nice example, a fairly small one. If you actually have, instead of having just one or two massive stars, you have hundreds or thousands of massive stars in a fairly small area, they blow really big bubbles. Instead of just little tiny bubbles, they blow bubbles that are sort of thousands of light years in size. And that's what we're looking at here. This is an example um, where we're actually observing an atomic hydrogen emission. So we're looking at a hydrogen gas. And where it's white, there's lots of it. Where there's black, there's not very much. And this is a bubble blown into the galaxy that has a radius of about 1,000 light years and would have taken something like 10 to the 40 megajoules of energy to form. Um, this is sitting a little ways away from us in the galaxy, about 20,000 light years away. So you can see this lovely, lovely, lovely bubble. And I'll talk a little bit about why it's broken in just a few minutes there. Everybody still with me? No major questions? OK, good. <laughs> if you move on from that question very quickly, you don't have to take any questions. Um, so the galaxy is filled with so-called super shells, very large bubbles, uh, which float around in the galaxy. And this is just a, a particular field where we see two of them. We see that one that I just showed you there, and this one here. And although this one looks really, really, really big compared to that, it's just a matter of perspective. It's closer to us than that one. Um, and lots of little loops and filaments are possibly caused by more of these massive stars and blowing bubbles. So it's like our galaxy is sort of like Swiss cheese, really. It's got all these holes blown in it by massive stars. And the neat thing about that is you still see these holes. So it's, they're sort of like fossils of where very massive stars lived and died. And now they're gone, and you see the holes left over. Um, they have important effects in the evolution of the galaxy because they actually cool down gas, form molecular clouds, and new stars can form. So I'll show you some examples of where we think that's happening. So if you zoom in on this tiny little corner right here, you're looking at the corner of this bubble here. And this blue stuff up here is a molecular cloud. Uh, it doesn't look like a very exciting picture of a molecular cloud, but um, take my word for it, it's, uh, it's a molecular cloud. And we think that new stars will form in those type of clouds. We actually see that in many, many examples of, uh, of super shell type objects. So we see these little protrusions in these bubbles are all very cold. We think that's because the gas has been swept up there in the snowplow. And as it gets more and more and more gas, the denser it gets, the colder it gets. Now, if you go back to our pressure equilibrium equation that we had, we saw that if it was more dense, then it tended to be colder. And that's for various reasons of cooling processes. But the, um, the basic is the more dense you get the gas, the colder it gets, the more likely it is to form molecules and then to form stars. So wherever we see these little blue things here, these are a whole bunch of little molecular clouds. And we see that in another object, very similar, and another one there. So here we're just pulling all the gas together and making it cold. So we think that massive stars will blow a bubble in the gas, totally disrupt it, but cool down the edges where the snowplow has plowed up all the gas, those cool down, new molecular clouds are formed, new stars are formed, and the cycle continues. So one of the other things that happens is that these objects can actually force gas completely out of the galaxy. So gas can escape to the halo through either two sort of models. And things in astronomy have really nice names. And my mom is an artist who thinks things sound really sort of beautiful. We have chimneys and we have fountains in the galaxy. We've got bubbles and it's all very lovely. Um, so there's two ways the gas can go out. So we have these bubbles. They grow very, very large and they pop. They hit the edge of the, the galaxy. They pop and they spew whatever was in them out into the halo of the galaxy. Or they get just very hot and they rise up buoyantly out of the galaxy. Nice little bubbles just rising up. One of these two things possibly happens, or maybe both. 
Now, this is important to how the galaxy works because we have this halo of gas sitting around our galaxy, and it has a certain amount of weight to it. And it's got a reasonable amount of weight, and there's a lot of gas down in the disk, which is gravitationally attracting this massive halo. And if it doesn't have something to hold it up, it's just going to collapse down, fall down on us. Um, and we don't see that happening. We see that the halo is actually held up. So something's holding it up. What's holding it up? We think it is gas flowing out of the galaxy through these bubbles, providing some sort of thermal support to hold up the galaxy there. But we don't actually see as many chimneys as we need. So I'll get back to that point in a minute. Um, so we think we need chimneys to hold up the halo. We also think we need it because we need to distribute the stellar byproducts around the galaxy. So when a star lives, it processes elements. It moves through uh, atomic hydrogen, moving up through heavier and heavier elements. And those elements need to get distributed around the galaxy so that they don't just stay in one place where there's a whole bunch of massive stars. And um, we think that these bubbles provide a way of distributing those elements. They go up, they move around, sort of like um, having a volcano, puts up its ash into the atmosphere, moves around, and comes back down in further places away. So we think that chimneys and, and shells do that. So this is a, that particular object that I showed you just a few minutes ago is actually a galactic chimney. And these little holes that I talked about where it's broken are where it has actually broken out of the disk of the galaxy. So the process that happens here is that we have a disk. It's very thin. Um, and this bubble's blowing in this disk. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And at some point, it reaches the edge of where most of the gas is. And now there's nothing for it to be pushing against. It's no longer pushing against a lot of gas. There's very little gas. And it just runs away. And it runs away, blowing all of its stuff out into the atmosphere. This is exactly like the process of a mushroom cloud from an atomic blast. So you let off an atomic bomb uh, close to the surface of the Earth, which hopefully we won't be doing again anytime soon. But um, when we did, uh, it blows a nice little cloud, nice in a not very good sense. Um, and that gets towards a lower density part of the atmosphere and blows away and produces this wonderful sort of mushroom-shaped object. So this is what happens here and has broken the gas out of these channels here. So the disk of the galaxy is where it's right along here. And these channels are presumably venting hot gas away from this object. And that's why it's called a chimney. So we don't have enough chimneys. We can count up the number of chimneys that we observe in the Milky Way on one hand. There's like four or five. And there's kind of debates about whether everything is actually a chimney. We need dozens in order to actually hold up the halo. And we only see a few. So something's missing. We're either not seeing enough chimneys or we don't understand how they work. Um, but we need to find more. Another example of the, how you get gas out of the, the disk is the case of buoyantly rising hot gas. So in this case, this is a, a wonderful looking mushroom cloud. And doesn't this just look like an atomic mushroom cloud? It's actually upside down that I flipped the image around. It doesn't look as pretty when you have an upside down mushroom. So we have hot, massive stars in the disk of the galaxy, and they're blowing hot gas. And that hot gas is just buoyantly risen out of the disk up to about 1,000 light years away. So in fact, we see many of these. Um, this is an image of hydrogen emission. I hope it's going to loop um, in our galaxy. So what we're looking at is the disk here. This is the entire southern sky. So the south celestial pole is here. That's like just straight down from the south pole of our own Earth. Um, and the equator is around the edges here. And you can see. Well, not so much anymore, but you can see lots of loops and filaments. Let's see if we can just go back. Uh oh, there we go. So you see all these loopy filaments. Those are formed by bubbles blowing gas up. The reason it gets very bright here, we're stepping effectively in distance through the galaxy as we're going through this movie. Um, the reason it got very bright there is because we were close to the sun. Now we're moving further away. So all of these little wispy filaments are places where gas has somehow been pulled up out of the galaxy's disk by these type of objects. And there's also little clumps of little tiny bits and pieces of fluff left around. And I'll talk a bit more about that. OK, so those little bits and pieces of clumps 
That movie is 540 megabytes, by the way, which is why the computer is just sitting here going. Mm. There we go. Okay. Um, those bits and pieces of clumps of gas that are put up by these objects, they throw gas up, and it either cools and then rains back down, or it's just been already cooled and it fragments from these loops that get pulled out of the, the disk. And it can take sort of tens of millions of years for the gas to cool down enough that it, that it uh, becomes visible again in atomic hydrogen. And then what happens to it? Do they just come back down where they were? Do they distribute themselves around the galaxy and fall down is something that we hope to be able to understand in the future and don't understand now. This is an example of a case of a, another super shell type object where we've got this nice big huge bubble and it's broken out of its top and carried walls with it. These little tiny walls up to very, very high heights above the disk. And that's cold gas up here. And these will, are breaking apart and it will eventually come flying back down onto the disk. So it's sort of like galactic rain. Okay, um, so our galaxy and many other galaxies has a bit of a problem. And its problem is that it has a lot of gas. It had a reservoir of gas. And it's been forming stars over the history of its life. And every time it forms a star and that star dies, it locks up a little bit of the matter from that star into something that is no longer in the interstellar gas. So uh, a star like the sun will eventually die and leave behind a white dwarf, a little dense blob of matter that is no longer going to be able to form new stars. So it's sort of continually leaving behind rocks. Um, and if you form all the stars that our galaxy has formed over its entire lifetime, you would use up this initial pool of gas that we had to form stars. So you're taking a little bit out of it every time you form a star and not putting it back. It's not a perfect recycling process in our galaxy. So you would have used up all of the fuel that the galaxy has to form new stars long ago, billions and billions and billions of years ago. Um, so something must be happening. We must get new gas from somewhere, new food, in order to keep our galaxy going. Otherwise, we would stop forming stars, and that hasn't happened. We see new stars forming all the time. So fresh gas fuel is needed in order to keep feeding the galaxy. And the image here is an example of the sort of thing that we think is feeding the galaxy. So this is a, an object called Smith's Cloud. And it's uh, something like a million times the mass of the sun hurtling itself towards our galaxy at 240 kilometers a second and is expected to collide with the galaxy in about 40 million years. Um, so what it does, it'll make a nice little blop, <laughs> and it'll be like a little raindrop in the ocean, and nothing very exciting will happen, even though it's a million masses of sun, a million times the solar mass. But it provides new gas, which should be able to form new stars. There's another million stars there ready to be formed in that. And we see little bits and pieces of gas like that all over uh, the galaxy. So, in this image here, we're looking again um, at atomic hydrogen gas, and we're looking at the disk of the galaxy here. These are our Magellanic Cloud neighbors here. And you see all these little yellow and green dots scattered about here? Those are bits of fresh new fuel. They're so-called high-velocity clouds. Um, they're gas that's moving at a high velocity with respect to our own galaxy, and we hope is coming in to provide new fuel. Another bit of new fuel is all the gas that's pulled off of these Magellanic clouds, these nearby galaxies, which we're slowly consuming, um, or at least we think we're slowly consuming. And so this tail behind them will be eventually colliding with our galaxy as well and providing a bit more fuel for us to go. But if you add up all these little dots that you see here and all the Magellanic cloud mass, it's still not enough to keep our galaxy going. So there's something missing. We're not seeing enough visible gas coming down onto the galaxy in order to replenish the amount that's being taken away in stars there. So something, something's gone wrong there. And we don't know what it is. Probably we're just not seeing something that's important. It's there, but we can't visibly detect it. Um, so I said that the, the nearby Magellanic clouds 
um, will probably be consumed with our by our galaxy. This has actually been a, a bit of controversy about this over the past few years. Uh, some Hubble Space Telescope measurements of the orbits of the Magellanic clouds predicted that they would actually go flying by the Milky Way and not can be consumed by our galaxy. Um, but if we go back to this image here, you can see this gas coming off, this purple stuff coming off here. This is gas that's leading away from the, the Magellanic clouds and actually crosses through our own galaxy. And we were able to see where it crossed and that changes the way the orbits of the galaxy must work and suggests that we are actually swallowing the Magellanic clouds. Um, now, swallowing them fairly slowly, it's going to be a long time before we really get them, um, but they're kind of gradually decaying and we're pulling some gas in. Okay, so if we go back to this image that we had here, um, we have looked at infall from intergalactic space. The Magellanic clouds coming in uh, and Smith's cloud coming in. This is gas that's refueling our galaxy, giving it new food. We've looked at super bubbles and bubbles, which are the products of stellar winds and, and supernovae from massive stars. We've looked at chimneys, uh, I got shifted over, chimneys here, which provide a way of getting gas out of the disk and up into extragalactic space. And we've looked a little bit at super bubbles compressing gas to form molecular clouds. So we've seen a, quite a bit of the evolution of the interstellar medium uh, just in the, the examples that we've shown here. So we've come a long way, but just there's a few things that we need to kind of figure out. And as I wrap up here in the next few minutes, um, I'll tell you what some of those things are. So there's some big questions left. Um, I've said that we've been trying to figure out the number of spiral arms in our galaxy over the past 50 years, and I don't think we've come up with the answer yet. Um, we've got a, this sort of open question, how many spiral arms are there? The galactic center distance is getting to be quite a lot better, but um, the R of ours are still on the order of 10% or so, and there's always a new paper that comes out every now and then that says, no, 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 that wasn't right. The distance is something else. So we need to figure that out. Where is the edge of the galaxy? That's something I didn't talk about um, because it's actually very hard to figure out where the edge of the galaxy is. Where does it stop being our galaxy and become intergalactic space? And to be able to answer that question, you need very, very sensitive telescopes uh, to get down to the very, very fine bits of gas that float out there. In terms of galaxy evolution, um, where is the missing infalling halo gas? If we add up the Magellanic clouds and the high velocity clouds, we don't see enough gas to keep the galaxy alive, so where is that missing stuff? Where are the missing chimneys that are holding up the halo so that it doesn't come crashing down on us? That um, we also don't know. And how do magnetic fields influence the galaxy? So this is just a sort of throw in at the end there, but um, I haven't talked at all about magnetic fields, but the galaxy is actually completely magnetized. Um, so this is a magnet. Hopefully you've all taken a magnet and iron filings at some point in your life and watched them move along the magnetic field lines between the two poles. We actually see the same thing in the sun, um, magnetic loops from so, and we see it in galaxies. These yellow lines here represent those iron filings that we can detect with radio telescopes in an external galaxy. And those iron filings trace along the spiral arms. We'd like to be able to know how that works on our own galaxy, and in order to do that, we need a new telescope. Um, there's not a, never an astronomy talk that doesn't finish with a we need statement, and that we need is usually something very expensive. Uh, the very expensive thing that we need at the moment, I think some of the best uh, instruments that we'll get for the future, the square kilometer array. Um, so I'll show you another slide about this. The square, square kilometer array, we hope will be built in Australia, um, but we don't know. Uh, will be the next great radio telescope, one square kilometer of collecting area, which should measure the hydrogen contents of the universe, but also to the furthest reaches of our own galaxy, uh, looking at magnetic fields and how they determine how the galaxy evolves. Um, and this is an artist's impression of what we think the square kilometer array will look like. It's a sort of um, a farm of telescopes popping up everywhere. Gaia 
uh, which is a space telescope to be launched by the European Space Administration that um, will measure the orbits of millions or, I even read on one page that it would measure billions of stars, but I find that I'm skeptical. Um, but the orbits of millions of stars, and that'll help us trace spiral structure and pin down the rotation curve and therefore the mass of our galaxy. ALMA, which is the Atacama Large Millimeter Array to be built in, um, well, being built and coming online soon in Chile, should help us study molecular cloud formation. How, do ga how does gas cool and form molecular clouds? So that's what ALMA is going to look like. So the, the square kilometer array, you just have to put a plug in. If you're in Australia and you're talking about radio astronomy, you have to talk about the square kilometer array. So this will be 100 times more powerful than any existing radio telescope. Um, and as I said, it should look like that little farm. To give you an indication of what that, that kind of means, um, current surveys of atomic hydrogen gas uh, have improve the resolving power, the detail that we can see, by about a factor of three. So this is a, what an image would have looked like of atomic gas in our galaxy 10 years ago. And this is what it looks like now. That's a factor of three improvement. The square kilometer array will be 100 times better than that. So it's almost unimaginable what kind of detail we're going to be able to see. And will presumably completely turn around everything that we think we know about the galaxy. No. Okay, so just wrap up. Um, I'd like to maintain that we can understand how galaxies as a whole evolve by looking at our own Milky Way as our own sort of backyard laboratory for understanding interstellar medium and galaxy evolution. And the interstellar medium is a very dynamic and varied place. It's got bubbles, it's got super bubbles, it's got chimneys. They move gas around at thousands to 10,000 kilometers per second. Um, it's not a closed box. We have gas going out of the galaxy. We have gas coming into the galaxy. It's constantly changing its makeup. And every year we learn something new about the structure of our galaxy. So although it is the closest galaxy that we can observe and we're in it and you would think we must be done and dusted, every year we're coming up with something new about how it works and what it looks like. New spiral arm in 2004, new central bar in 2005, New spiral model, 2008. Improved galactic center distance, 2008. New mass, 2009. Um, so every year, something changes. And those are not pinned down to be definite answers yet. There's still lots more to learn about the galaxy. And hopefully, it will keep me employed for many years to come. So thank you.